Hi everybody, Jacob Reed here from ReviewEcon.com. Today we're going to be talking about price elasticity of supply, cross price elasticity, and income elasticity. If after watching this video you still need a little more help, head over to ReviewEcon.com and pick up the total review booklet. It has everything you need to know to ace your microeconomics or macroeconomics exam. Let's get into the content. So in the last video, we learned about the price elasticity of demand. Now we're going to be talking about three other types of elasticity that you need to know on your microeconomics exam. And the first of those three is the price elasticity of supply. And just like with the price elasticity of demand, we are looking at how much a change in price impacts the quantity. In this case, the quantity supplied. A little side note, when it comes to price elasticity of supply, the total revenue test will not tell us if a supply curve is price elastic or price inelastic. The total revenue test only works with demand curves. And that's because the upward sloping supply curve means that total revenue is always going to increase as price increases. So when it comes to price elasticity of supply, we are going to be calculating our coefficients. And the formula for price elasticity of supply is the same as it was with price elasticity of demand. We're looking at the percentage change of the quantity, in this case the quantity supplied, divided by the percentage change of price. And of course the preferred formula for determining percentage change is new minus old divided by old times 100. That's called the end point method. And when we take the percentage change of quantity and divide it by the percentage change of price, that will give us an elasticity coefficient. Now supply curves are always going to have a positive price elasticity coefficient, but it's the absolute value that we look at just like we did with price elasticity of demand. If the elasticity coefficient has an absolute value that is greater than one, then that supply curve is price elastic. If the price elasticity of supply is exactly one, it's unit elastic. And if the price elasticity of supply is a decimal or less than one, then that supply curve has a relatively inelastic price elasticity of supply. By looking at the graph of a supply curve, we can determine its price elasticity. This is a price elastic supply curve. It intersects the price axis above zero, and that will have an elasticity coefficient that is greater than one. Here we have a supply curve that is relatively inelastic. It's going to intersect on the x-axis, and it will have a elasticity coefficient that is less than one. We also have our two possible extremes. This is a perfectly elastic supply curve that's going to have an elasticity coefficient of infinity or undefined. A perfectly elastic supply curve indicates that we can have any quantity at one particular price. And finally, we have our perfectly inelastic supply curve. That's a vertical supply curve. And here we can get one quantity at any price. And then the price elasticity coefficient of that supply curve is zero. Let's take a look at some examples here. If we have a 25% increase in price causes a 5% increase in the quantity supplied, we can remember our percentage change of quantity divided by percentage change of price is that coefficient. Plug in the numbers and do the math, and that's going to give us an elasticity coefficient of 0.2. And this supply curve will be relatively inelastic through this price range. Here's another example we'll have to use algebra to solve. Here we have a supply curve with a 10% increase in price and a price elasticity coefficient of two. Let's see if we can use algebra to determine the percentage change of the quantity supplied. Set up our formula and plug in the numbers that we do know. And then if we solve for X, we find that a 20% change in quantity divided by that 10% change in price gives us the coefficient of two. And since the absolute value of that coefficient is greater than one, this supply curve is relatively elastic. If instead we had a 15% change in quantity supplied, while this supply curve has a price elasticity of supply coefficient of one, then we can plug in the numbers we know into the formula and solve for the X percentage in price change. Of course here, it is a 15% change in quantity divided by a 15% change in price gives us the elasticity coefficient of one. And since the price elasticity of supply coefficient is one, this supply curve is unit elastic. Now the next type of elasticity we're going to talk about is income elasticity. You already learned a little bit about this when it came to demand. We know that changes in people's income will increase or decrease how much of a product people buy. And when it comes to income elasticity, we're looking at how much that change in income impacts the quantity people buy. In order to calculate income elasticity coefficients, we're going to take the percentage change of quantity divided by the percentage change of income. If this gives us a positive income elasticity coefficient, then that good is a normal good. As you know, normal goods are things like shoes. When people's incomes increase, people buy more shoes. And the opposite would also be true. When people's incomes decrease, people buy fewer shoes. And since income and quantity are going in the same direction, there will be a positive income elasticity coefficient when we have normal goods. If you calculate a negative coefficient for a particular good, 
that good is an inferior good. Condensed soup is one of those inferior goods. As people's incomes decrease, they will buy more condensed soup. And that inverse relationship between the income of consumers and the quantity people buy means this good is inferior. Now we can take a look at some examples to see if we can calculate income elasticity. If a 20% increase in income causes a 5% increase in the quantity demanded for a particular product, we can plug in the numbers into our formula, do the math, and find out that a 5% change in quantity divided by a 20% change in income gives us a 0.25 income elasticity coefficient. And since that income elasticity coefficient is positive, this good is a normal good. If a 14% decrease in income causes a 7% increase in quantity demanded, then we can take those numbers and plug them into our formula to find a 7% change in quantity divided by a negative 14% change in income gives us a negative 0.5 elasticity coefficient. And since we have a negative elasticity coefficient, this good is inferior. We might also have to use algebra to find a missing variable as well. If we have an income elasticity coefficient of 0.5 and there is a 10% change in income, we can plug that number into the formula and solve for X percentage change of quantity, do some algebra to determine that it is a 5% change in quantity that resulted from that 10% increase in income. And of course, this is a positive elasticity coefficient of 0.5. That means this good is normal. The final type of elasticity that you need to know is called cross price elasticity. Cross price elasticity is about how prices of one good impact the demand for a different good. So cross price elasticity is about substitutes and complements. The formula for cross price elasticity is the percentage change in the quantity of one good divided by the percentage change in the price of the other good. If we get a positive cross price elasticity coefficient, then that means the goods in question are substitute goods like jelly and honey they are substitute goods. When the price of jelly increases, people will buy less jelly and increase their demand for honey as a result. This direct relationship between the price of one good and the demand for the other good means the goods are substitutes. If on the other hand, we get a negative cross price elasticity coefficient, then that means the goods in question are complements. Complementary goods are things like peanut butter and jelly. If the price of jelly decreases, then people will buy more jelly and they will need more peanut butter as a result as well. And this inverse relationship between the price of one good and the demand for the other good means these goods are complementary. Now we can take a look at some examples here and practice calculating. If the price of good X decreases by 10% and that causes a 10% decrease in the quantity demanded of good Y, we can plug those numbers into our elasticity coefficient. You'll notice here that quantity is always on top when it comes to calculating elasticity coefficients. Keep that in mind so you don't get confused. And when we plug in the numbers here, we can see that the negative 10% change in the quantity of one good divided by the negative 10% change in the price of the other good gives us a cross price elasticity coefficient of one. And since this elasticity coefficient is positive, these goods are substitute goods. If on the other hand, the price of good X decreases by 4% and that causes an 8% increase in the quantity demanded for good Y, we can go ahead and plug the numbers into our formula and determine that the cross price elasticity coefficient of these two goods is negative two. And since that coefficient is negative, these goods are complementary. And there you have it. That's what you need to know about other elasticity coefficients. If you've already watched the price elasticity of demand video, it's time to head over to reviewecon.com and practice the elasticity calculations game. If you still need more help after that, pick up the total review booklet. It has everything you need to know to ace your microeconomics or macroeconomics exam. That's it for now. I'll see you all next time.